Shalom, everybody, and welcome to the Shai Fleischer Show, broadcasting live from Judea to the world. You're a part of it wherever you are. Shalom, and welcome to Malka Fleischer. Hello. Malka, day 102, I think, of the war. Um, billion. Yeah. 102 billion. Right, like this is, but, but for us in Israel, it's like, you know, October 8th around here. That's what people say. It's like, yeah. it's just the one, it's a hundred day long day. Right, yeah. People are saying, I think we said it last yeah, time. It's that's like, right. it's October 102nd. Right. Um, with all that, the war continues, um, and young men are, are being killed, uh, in battle. Um, and yesterday, not so far away from here, there was a car accident right? That was of an army soldier. Was I, was, I was in the traffic jam Oy. and I had to, I got to see the, you know, turned over Aftermath. Jeep. Yeah, it's it was terrible. It was, it was terrible. Off. Someone, uh, a soldier was killed from that. Yeah. You know, and, and our daughter Leah says to me, she goes, you know, it's not a time of, uh, of Rachamim, it's a time of din. There's yeah. a lot of dinim. There's a lot of uh, judgment. Harsh judgment, yeah. And not mercy. And I told her, you know, there's a truth to that. And there's another side, which is like there's there's mercy everywhere. Right, right, the right. net of mercy is all around us. We just don't always feel it. You know, we don't always feel it. But but there's this like, you know, there's this like bloodletting and this this, this pain there. I want to tell you, I have a... Um, sa'arat regashot. I'm like full of emotions right, right now. Ups and downs. No, not ups and downs. Emotion, you know. Uh, ups and downs of emotion. All right. What is? What do you all mean? Right, when right. You s- all right, ups and downs. I'll, I'll all stay, right, I'll say. But I, I just meant to say that wasn't the graphic image that I thought. It wasn't undulations. Okay, what was your graphic image? It was more earthquakey. You know what I mean? Hmm. It's not up and down. Okay, it's, okay, it's more okay, like okay. It's, there's an intensity and the, yeah. I would say I would say squeeze and release as opposed to up and down. You know what I mean? Okay, like a, you, you know what I'm saying. Because uh-huh. it's not I'm in not and like, out. Because I'm not like high and happy and low and depressed. Uh-huh. I'm just like oh grit, and then a little bit of a release and back mm-hmm. to grit. That's that's right. that's okay. the undulation there. All right. So um, so uh, first thing is that yesterday you took a picture of me on the way to work because yep. I, I had a day off from the army, so I put on my uh, cowboy hat and I went with uh, some of the uh, I went to Chevron. And I went to work with my secretary about some issues. We have a drone that's stuck inside the uh, meches, the customs, customs. At the airport. So I'm trying to unstuck the drone. That's a bureaucratic nightmare. It fell into like a web of bureaucracy. That's bad. It was annoying. Uh, but we we're dealing with that, and and uh, and and uh, uh, the director general of the Jewish community of Chevron, Uri Uri Karzen, who listens to the show, had a birthday. Mazel so happy tov. birthday! Mazel and I tov. did a little Mazel video tov. of his big project, which is the um, which is the building of 30 apartments in Hebron. What a massive project it is. And I went to the dig site. And How's it looking? Out. Are they working? They're digging. It's digging down. You got to go down before you go up. It's called Yerida Letzor Chaliyah. Are they like, exca- <laughs> is it, there any excavating to there? What do you mean? Is there like, are you finding cool stuff in the dirt? No, we're done with finding cool stuff. Uh-uh. We're, we're, we're below cool stuff now. Now we're like at like geology, not, right, uh, right, right. not archaeology. Uh, we we did, we went through archaeology. We okay. finished with that. Now we're in geology, so um, that's you know very special. And we're also coming out with a movie soon, a very special movie that I can't tell you all the contours and secrets of because it's going to be awesome and blow your face off. It's going to be so awesome of how spiritually uplifting it's going to be. Uh, so work on that. And then I also had volunteers at um, um, I had volunteers, Hayovel volunteers at the tomb of Ruth and Ishai. And we were building and moving rocks, and these guys were, uh, they were Mennonites. Mazel tov to, the, to Chava, by the way, on her recent engagement. That's right. That's right. Hayovel engagement. Engagement to Josiah. That's right. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. Okay, great. And uh, yeah, you heard it here. We're excited. Um, Good match. And we had a lot of fun because were, they were, the folks were Mennonites, and I said, you guys put the men back into Mennonite. These guys, <laughs> we had a great time. And, and then, I don't know anything about Mennonites, the, the, except that they cook in large batches and so sometimes i go online and then there's good mennonite recipes well this show will not be covering you know the mennonite religion mennonite faith although interestingly enough they speak a german dialect they like know another language they speak this like this like dutch german dialect it was very interesting were they talking that is that they're they, like they, they're yiddish between, between, yeah, between each themselves, other no. yeah. and if and if a rock falls on their foot they they say something in in, uh, Oi, in, sprachen, in, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, Deutsch. Ay, like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> it was really very cultured here on but the Ishai Fleischer show. My best moment though yeah. was we had this Druze fighter 
this Jerusalem Israeli soldier. Yeah. And he came down from his position. And Where they were, like, he was working, he was in a position near the workers? Yeah, at the tomb of Rutin okay. there's there's an army position there. And he came and helped out with these, with these you know, Dutch-German-speaking American, uh, Ohioan, Mennonite, pro-Israel Christian folks. Right. And then there was me, you know. It was a veritable rainbow of right, uh, cultures. Know, Russian-American, Israeli, Jewish guy with a cowboy hat. And and we were the all, Cholent pot, if you will, the Cholent pot of yeah. And then and Jewish then I read life. to them the verse that says, you know, that the nations will come to honor the the final resting place of Ishai. So so you know from Isaiah mm-hmm. uh, chapter eleven verse ten. And what they think? I, I don't know. There was just a moment. I took a picture of it. You could see it on my Facebook page. Like there was a or or on my Twitter. Like there was just a picture of like I, I wrote good old Americans. I no no I no not the good old man. I said a pro Israel. Druze Israeli oh, of the, soldier. Of the soldier. Oh, of all of them together. The three of us. Got it, got a it. Got pro it, got Israel Druze Israeli soldier with a pro Israel American Gentile with a pro Israel Israeli Orthodox Jew. You know, just and and the, the Druze guy was strongly pro Israel, strongly cool. anti anti, you know, Palestinian authority and all that kind of stuff. And it was just it was just a moment in time. It was just a moment in time. And we were all there like building an ancient site. There was just like a cosmic wow. moment so that was you know what you would call a high before or like or right. like, a, like a like a release it was a beautiful moment then today i don't know what happened i was i needed i I have a i have a weird thing i needed to relax a little bit and i wanted to find some tv but out of nowhere popped up the trial of uh of of adolf eichmann which is by the way sometimes pronounced eichmann interesting enough the the he like you is pronounced Eichmann. All right, I didn't know that. Anyway, holy what? cow, Malka! <laughs> That's what you look. Everybody, I holy would like moly. you to meet Ishai Fleischer. Holy okay? cow! Ishai has many interesting facets to him. One of them is that his idea of relaxation is to listen to history of the Adolf Eichmann trial. Yeah, go it on. Was, it wasn't. It wasn't just. Uh, it wasn't just listening to it. It wasn't just listening. It was watching. And it turns out that there's a whole story about how how the Eichmann trial was filmed. And it turns out that the Eichmann trial was actually much less about Eichmann the dude, mm-hmm. which was actually about something that had been been kept inside the stomach of mm-hmm. Israeli Jews for ten for twelve years. Mm-hmm. No, 15 years. Okay. Which is the Holocaust. Sure. And suddenly people came out. And they got to say their piece. They got to say their thing. Wow. And I want to tell you something. I've seen a lot imagine. of I've seen a lot of Shaw stuff, but mm-hmm. this was different. These were people with accents speaking sometimes in Hebrew but sometimes in different languages, Israelis mm-hmm. talking about their experiences. One How did guy they look they look like survivors, yeah. you know, which means strong. Mm-hmm. But like when this stuff came out and there was like three very, like very shocking stories to me. Uh, but one of them, how could there be shocking stories? It's no, like no. we haven't heard every single horrific Holocaust story. This was, this was a crazy thing. This, this, there was things there that I never saw before. Like what? There was one guy who was on the stand. Wait, is this okay for kids? Do we need to give a warning ahead of this? No, there was one guy on the stand and he was talking about how he was a doctor and he one time saw a child being whipped. And for some reason, he started counting and he counted 80 whips. Ugh. And then he said, yeah, people you know, didn't believe me when I told them that I saw this kind of thing. They thought I was exaggerating. And then the prosecutor says, do you see that child in this courtroom today? And he goes, yes. That's that police, police, Jewish police officer Whoa. right there, and that was one of the main like police officers who was like uh, the captured and 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 and, and brought Eichmann oh to gosh. trial. It was just like wow. a crazy moment. And then this guy, the police officer, was on camera talking later on about this experience, and he said that when he came to Israel and, and he once talked one time, told somebody that he was whipped eighty times, and the person said to in Hebrew to his wife because he didn't think the kid spoke Hebrew. Mm-hmm. He said, these, these Holocaust survivors, they exaggerate. Boy. And he goes, that was the 81st whip. 
Oh, yeah, that's what he said. I, 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 Malka, I tell oh you. Oh my God, I don't even know what to do with that. Then, then there was another one. Okay, which was like, this guy was working. The, you know, there was these, uh, you know, the Einstein's group and who were killing Jews by either bullets or by these uh, mobile gas chambers and these, you know, cars, these trucks. Anyway, he was one of the people that had to take bodies out. Ugh. And then finally he starts seeing people from his town. Oh. And then finally he starts seeing his family, his wife and kids. No, no. And he says to the Nazis, this guy's on the stand in Jerusalem. He goes, he says to the Nazis, he said, I lie down next to my family and I said, please kill me now. And they said, no, you can still work. And they beat him until he got up and kept working and digging. So, you know, and I was like, I was, I'm watching this today while washing dishes. And I'm just like, oh my God. And, and then... And I realized, like, like you, you know, here, here in Israel today, we are dealing with this kind of stuff again. Right. There's people holding stuff in their stomachs for sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're- I saw somebody on Twitter. I know it's not the same, right? But it's like I saw somebody on Twitter who was commenting about how uh, somebody had written something about how the UN had uh, done almost nothing in such a disgusting way to recognize what women had been through particularly in this october 7th and i you guys all know what i'm talking about um and this one person commented on that post and was like you, we you can't understand like the suffering that that some are oh and they were talking about how how like so many israeli families are just like feeling broken right now and 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 so unrecognized and and um, this one person wrote like my nephew was kidnapped and you can't understand and they're a hostage now and we don't know where he is and you can't understand no one can understand how completely destroyed we are we're like devastated right now we and you know even to use words like devastated or destroyed you like you hear these words and these are words that are like common in the nomenclature of suffering but like there's no words for these people to use to tell you what it is that they're holding in you know what i mean how they're trying to just keep from totally collapsing in their lives yeah so that's what I'm talking about. Like, 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 I had this beautiful day yesterday in Hebron, and then, right. and then all this stuff. Wow. And then, and then, you know, our daughter Leah mm-hmm. fell off a horse mm-hmm. and is still suffering from back pains. Mm-hmm. It's getting better, Baruch thank Hashem, God, but she's God, still like God. not sleeping mm-hmm, properly, mm-hmm. and she's having a hard time on the bus and all kinds of. And, and in her school, the stairs. Right, she's in pain, right? She's still in pain. So I went to pick her up today, and something happened to me on the way, which is that um, at the beginning of the war, at the beginning of the war, there was this video released of this cool Israeli guy seemingly not religious singing this mm-hmm, song mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I knew and he and he's this the song is a very famous words that we say in the morning when you wake up you're supposed to say Elohai neshama she natata tehorabi or uh, natata be natata tehorabi, tehorabi. Right. The, 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 the soul that you gave me is so it's pure right and and you're you are in the future going to take it from me and bring Return it back it to me, me Bill, I'm about, right? right? And he's singing this with such passion. I knew when I saw that back then, mm-hmm. I knew that this had done something to me. Wow! I was like, I knew. I saw this video. I was just like, I knew that this was like. Oh, sorry. He was driving on the way mm-hmm. to the festival, Nova festival, Nova festival in Reim, where he was killed. Right. His name was Yehuda Becher. Mm-hmm. I knew when I saw that video. That it 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 just I knew back then I was just like and I sent it to the groups and I saw that um, other people some were moved some were that but I knew that some it did right, something it did inside something of me to you right? I, I could that's, feel that's it. Uh, that's so beautiful because he's gone and to think that he was able to affect you uh, it, is, is is very big for him it 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 it, right. it, it had a it it had a turn in my soul like something happened to me and I I you know and I'm not like that I'm not like that you know what I mean I'm not I'm not I'm not touchy feely like that you know but I was just like let's say. It it just did something to me. Yeah, and then a few days ago, Rabbi Manus Friedman put out a video talking about that, hmm. and that reminded me of that video of his singing uh. video. And then I started doing a little YouTubing, which is also something that I'm not like a big thing that I do, like looking around. And so I found the original video of this of Yehuda of Yehuda Becher singing the song mm-hmm. on the way down to the Reim festival right. saying you God gave me a pure soul and then and then um 
so 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 I found the video of him singing the song. Mm-hmm. Yehuda Becher sure. on the way yeah, down, yeah. driving to the Reim Festival where he's going to be killed, talking about the purity of his soul, and and that that his soul is going to be taken from him and returned to him. I found that video. Then I found Rabbi Manus Friedman explaining this story, and then I found another video, which his brothers made with that song, singing that song with this singer Avishai, who sings the song originally and is one of you know like an Israeli singer together with his brothers and you'll and what i'm going to do now is i want to play you wow. one yehuda becher singing the song it's only a minute and a half him singing the song then i want to play to you manus friedman for you manus friedman explaining the story and then i want to play for you the brothers singing the song you're going to hear them in the middle of the of the song you know, um, eulogizing him just a little bit and blessing him, saying, we're here below, you're above. And then you'll hear his voice compiled, singing with him at the end there. I don't know well, what You're going to have to peel us off the floor. How are you going to do this to us? You know what? I don't know. It moved my heart in such a way that I... And I played it for Leah on the way home when I picked her up yeah. also. And it was just like we... Wow. You know, Did you guys just sit there crying? Uh, I, I had already tried to do my crying before I picked her up. But the point is is that is that I, I think everybody should 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 feel these these feelings, Okay. So, oh, I just want to explain to you what this guy looks like. He's like muscly. He's kind of blondish or, or uh, light haired. And he's like this cool Israeli guy. But it turns out that he loved Torah. That he comes from a religious home, but he wasn't ever in the... In the he didn't fit in the mold. But he didn't fit the mold. But he loved Judaism and he loved Torah, but he loved people. And one of the things that they complained about him was that sometimes in the middle of camping or something like that, he would start yelling, thank you, God, for everything. Thank you. That's his thing. That was his thing. His thing was to thank God for everything. And I want to say, if I could pull it off here without crying here, I want to say that I have a gut feeling that he was able to thank God even as he was being killed and he was able to thank God even for that moment. And, I'm, and, and for the first time in my life, I truly believed in the resurrection of the dead. Wow. I truly, truly believe. I know that this boy, his neshama is, 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 is pure, as he says, as he sings, and that his soul will come back to him. It was just, anyway, that's what I meant by, by, by like, you know, squeeze and let go. It was just like, I, and I'm telling you, I was it's seized. It's interesting because this was happened already this 100 and plus days ago and only now it's like uh I, I was seized by this thing there then i knew it when i saw it and it, it kept coming back to me but like then it Hit all today it, it, it all just all came together so here we go the first thing you're going to hear is oh he's singing this while driving and he's taping him filming himself and and he's like singing with the original the tape, song yeah. with the tape so you'll hear him singing it then you'll hear manus friedman explaining uh this story and then you're going to hear the brothers singing, a little bit of eulogizing, and then his voice come back. So uh, hold on to your seatbelts, folks. It's something, you know. And again, the words are, you know, God, you've given me a soul. It's a pure soul. Uh, and I, I know that you've given it to me, and, and, uh, and you're destined to take it from me and then return to me in the resurrection of the dead. Here is Yehuda Becher. Allah wa shalom. Zecher tzadik levracha. Hashem yukom demo. I'm 
pelo eu voltar e vou colar mais adoro colar de chamor e vou colar mais adoro colar de What is he singing? It, it, it's, it's so life-changing. There's a, there's a tape, a clip, of a young man who is driving to the festival. He's singing in the car. He is not wearing a kippah. He's not wearing tzitzit. He is singing the words. Hello. <laughs> What you see there is a chelek eleka mima al mamish singing. You hear this? Ve'ata atid litla mimeni, u'lahachzir abi la'atid lavo. And he was killed, murdered. These are the people who were singing at the festival. And then he sings with, with, a, with an, a smile like an angel. He sings, calls man for another hour. If you don't know that that is every single Jew, just covered up a little bit because of the Arichut HaGalut. If you don't know that, it's been 300 years since the Baal Shem Tov told us that this is what a Jew is, and you still don't know it? You're very difficult to educate. That's a simple truth, a beautiful, simple truth. So you're going to be critical of such a person? Without learning, without knowing, without understanding, without the years and hours of, of learning Kabbalah and Hasidut, and this simple man understood Hashem better. Bepashtut, that's a chelek aleka mima'al mamash. And sometimes you have to remind yourself, whatever you think, whatever you do, you succeed, you fail, that you are also a chelek aleka mima'al. Thank you. 
קיבלה ממני אולי חזירה בלעתיד לבוא כל זמן שהנשמה בקרבי מודה אני לפניך כל זמן שהנשמה בקרבי מודה אני לפניך שבטוח שטוב לך שמה, אחרת לא היית מוסיף לך איך אלינו ביום ולילה. אהוב שלנו, דש מלמטה, ובזכותך אומרים כל בוקר, אלוהי נשמה בכוונה, ולא נשכח אותך, כי לנו היית במתנה. All right, that was... I'm, I'm sorry I had to drop that on you, uh, all of you folks. Yeah, but, thanks. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's good, right? We can't, like, uh, turn away. But that was not easy. No, but, it, but it's, it's more than that, though, Malka. It's, uh, it's, it's not the sadness. It's that this is the heart of the Jewish people. And it all tied into me with this Eichmann trial thing. It's like, Am Yisrael Chai. That, that, that's what it tied in. Like, like the point is, is that they extinguished the, the match, but, they, but the fire is lit. You know what I mean? Am Yisrael is going to... And I saw his brothers. Mm. I could see that that light, his light... Right, they, shines they're not and, uh, extinguished. And, and there's 100,000 views on this video and, you know, of, of the guy singing. Uh, of the, uh, no, on, on, the, on, the, on the musician singing and the Becher video, forget about it. The point is, is that this has touched millions of lives, including my life, maybe your life, and the Bezrat Hashem uh, will continue to be strong. Ow, whew. That's some, that's some stuff. Anyway, Am Yisrael Chai, definitely Am Yisrael Chai, definitely, definitely Am Yisrael Chai lives. And that's the thing, you know what gives me joy is that Khumenai <laughs> Khumeni ah. yeah. he, at the end he's a loser. <laughs> you know? And so was Eichmann, he's a loser. Right. He's a loser. At the end he was judged in Jerusalem. Right. In Hebrew. Right. By the Jews. Speaking of judgment, I just wanna I wanna I'm glad you brought up judgment. Uh Israel's being tried in the international court. Yeah. 
So I listened to. I would a, try them. I would bring them. So I just wanted to say. I just wanted to say to be that, tried. The that I listened to an interesting audio from Tehila Gimpel from the Land of Israel Network, and she was talking about this. Um, and the conclusion that she came to, I'll, I'll wrap it up really quick, is that she is that God is on trial. That basically it comes from the Book of Isaiah, and God talks about how the nations will gather, um, will gather together, and they'll they'll like try God and that Israel is God's witness. Um, and I, I thought that was really great, but in actuality, I just want to extend that a little bit. I, I don't have a, uh, a book of Isaiah verse for you, but it occurred to me that the, on, in this trial, Israel is not on trial. The world is on trial. The nations of the world are on trial that they're gathering together. They think that they're judging us. They're not judging us. They don't have the power to judge us. There's only one judge and he's judging and he knows how to make the judgment. And he's looking at this court case right now and making his judgments. And you better be on the right side of the judgment. Now here, Am Israel, the Jewish people, as you were talking about before, even our young children understand that this is a hard moment for the Jews and that God is saying something to us. It's not as if we live in a bubble of perfection and that the Jewish people are not being judged, whereas the world, you know, is. Obviously, the Jewish people, and we hold ourselves to a very high standard, that the Jewish people are, are facing judgment right now. But we are the, the children of the king, and we know that in the end that we will get mercy, even, even after hardship, and we've seen the, the horrible aftermath of our judgment. But that has nothing to do with you nations of the world what what that's our business that's our family business that has nothing to do with you but you and how you treat the jewish people that's on you you and how you treat whether you whether you you know the it's a mitzvah the 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 non-jews are actually obligated to a few commandments not not as much as we are but they do have commandments one of their commandments it's called the Sheva Mitzvah Open Noach, the, the seven Noahide commandments, is to establish courts of justice. The ICJ right now is charging Israel on charges of genocide, that we are wiping out a race of people. And this is a real flouting of God's law because it is the obligation of all men to be truthful and to judge honestly and to judge fairly, this case is not that. They established this case knowing very well exactly what the judgment will be before anyone stepped into the courtroom. And this, I, I think the, the judgment will be severe on the nations of the world. And I really, I really pray for all good people of the world that they will not be caught up in this serious judgment that will fall on the nations who gathered against Israel. Um, in the next audio that I'm going to play, Malka, you're going to hear uh, a panel, and Josh Reinstein is going to talk about, uh, amongst the panel, he's going to talk about how pro-Israel Gentiles, 5,000 of them marched at The Hague against this trial. Wow. So we'll, we'll, we'll hear about that. Listen, uh, I got to uh, get the show wrapped up just because uh, uh, of limitations. It's already Thursday night here, and the editing has got to happen, everything like that. But let me, let me first thank all the folks that make the show happen. Uh, which is Yochevet Seidman, Moshe Herman, Ben Bresky, Tabitha, and Lewin were live. Thank you so much for, for producing the show. Uh, I also want to thank um, all of our sponsors. Our sponsors include uh, the good folks at uh, RetroWatchGuy.com. Great watches from, from the past, alive today, just like the Jewish people. Uh, so check them out. They're doing great stuff, RetroWatchGuy.com. Uh, check out our good friends at uh, Making Delightful Foods uh, for the Soul. And that is at uh, prohibitionpickle.co.il. Right. Uh, awesome kosher food with a kick. Prohibitionpickle.co.il. Our friends at jns.org and jewishpress.com. Two wonderful news websites. Different uh, and both complement one another. Jewishpress.com, jns.org. Um, thank you very much to the Hebron Jewish community uh, for keeping the tomb of the fathers and mothers safe. They're the Knights of the Machpelah. And that is uh, hebronfund.org. Hebronfund.org. And to go to the Temple Mount and connect to Yerushalayim, Yer Kodesh, uh, the Holy Land, the, the, the heart of the Holy Land. And that is at highontheheart.com, highontheheart.com. And of course, 
Tour the Land of Israel at koshercycletours.com. Lots of great friends, koshercycletours.com. They're making great stuff. Thank you, Aaron, for doing, for, for, for showing us the beauties of the land from uh, two wheels. Awesome. Um, Malka Ben Bresky has a very special audio today, and that audio is actually be, before we get to the Reinstein audio, uh, the, 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 which has a lot of good folks on it Eugene Kantorovich, Alex Trayman, uh, uh, Mark Zell, a lot of people on a panel that I'm going to play you from the second part of the uh, 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 sovereignty conference that I was at last week. Before that, Ben Bresky on the Baba Sali. The Baba Sali had his yard site last week, and so therefore uh, we're going to have a segment from our intrepid reporter, Ben Bresky, on the story of the Baba Sali and some other stories having to do with uh, the story of this great righteous man. Here's Ben Bresky on the Baba Sali. This is a moment in Jewish history. This week marks the 40th anniversary of the passing of the Baba Sari, a revered rabbi who attracted thousands for prayers and blessings. He was known as a miracle worker, and many stories of healing are told about him. I once attended the Hilula, the annual memorial ceremony for him, in which thousands arrived to the small working-class city of Nitivot in Israel's south. A bonfire blazed outside a domed structure which serves as a synagogue and houses the burial site of the rabbi. As during his lifetime, spiritual seekers flocked to his grave to pray. There was music, barbecue, and traditional Moroccan pastries. Rabbi Yisrael Abu Hatzera, known as the Baba Sali, or Praying Father, was born in Risani, Morocco, to a long line of learned rabbis. Rabbi Shmuel Elbaz, the patriarch of the family, was born in the 1590s in Jerusalem and was a student of the great Kabbalistic sage Rabbi Chaim Vital. The name Abu Hatzera means father of the carpet, and one version of how he obtained this name was when Rabbi Shmuel Elbaz was sent as an emissary and fundraiser to the Jewish community of Turkey, but he was denied entry on the ship. Thus, the rabbi took a small carpet and flew there. Rabbi Shmuel Elbaz later became head of the Eliyahu Hanavi Synagogue in Jobar near Damascus, Syria. The synagogue was built on top of a cave where, according to local tradition, the prophet Elijah hid. A sign states the synagogue existed since the days of the first temple. Writers and travelers dating back to the Middle Ages mention having visited and prayed there. The Damascus blood libel of 1840 led to rioting and the desecration of the synagogue. In 2013, the synagogue was severely damaged during the Syrian civil war. The Abu Khatsara family immigrated to Morocco, which at the time had a thriving Jewish community, one of the largest in the world. Rabbi Yaakov Abu Khatsara, known as the Abir Yaakov, was born in 1806 in Morocco. At a young age, he was already considered a Torah genius and was sought after to answer difficult halachic questions. He was known for his aesthetic lifestyle, seldom making small talk, fasting, praying, studying Kabbalah, and collecting and distributing money to the poor. Both Jews and Muslims visited him for advice and blessings. The Abir Yaakov had a great yearning to move to the land of Israel, but his congregation begged him to stay. Finally, he convinced the community that his son would take his place. During his journey, he fell ill and passed away in Egypt. For generations after, his grave in Egypt became a pilgrimage site on the date of his passing. The book Yagel Yaakov contains his poetry as well as that of other family members. Rabbi Masoud Abu Khatsera took over for his father in Morocco. He too was a Kabbalah scholar and wrote many rulings on halachic issues and many songs and poems called Piyutim, which are still sung by the Moroccan Jewish community today. His son, David Abu Khatsera, took over for him and followed the custom of a simple and humble life, spending much time alone studying and fasting. When the French took over Morocco, there was much political upheaval. A Muslim leader accused the Jewish community of siding with the French. He decreed that all Jews of the region be put to death. Rabbi David Abu Khatsera told the community that he prayed that only he would be executed and the rest of the community spared. 
The troops rounded up the Jewish residents in a courtyard. They executed the rabbi with a cannon. The rest of the community was spared, but forbidden to have any type of memorial service. Rabbi David's two brothers, Yitzhak and Yisrael, moved to the land of Israel in the 1920s following the incident. Yitzhak Abu Hatzera was known as the Baba Chaki. He and his family initially lived in Givat Olga, a transit camp near Hadera. When the chief rabbi of the land of Israel heard of his arrival, he came to meet him and initiated his appointment as chief rabbi of Ramla and Lod. He served as rabbi for 20 years and was also a member of the chief rabbinical council. The other brother, Rabbi Yisrael Abu Hatzera, became known as the Baba Sari. Upon his arrival in Israel in the 1920s, he studied at the famous Beit El Yeshiva in the old city of Jerusalem. He went back and forth, living in the land of Israel and Morocco over the years. At one time, he thought to live in the United States near the Lubavitcher Rebbe. But the Rebbe, head of the Chabad Hasidic movement, wrote him a letter encouraging him to continue to help educate and lead his community. In the 1960s, he permanently settled in Israel. He lived in a small public housing project home in the working-class development city of Nativot in Israel's south. People flocked to the small desert town for blessings and prayers. There are many miracle stories about him. Once, on a ship on the way to Israel, a terrible storm arose. He instructed his students to pour the Kiddush wine into the sea, upon which it calmed down. Petitioners who arrived at his home were asked about their level of religious observance and encouraged to be strong in Jewish tradition. A wheelchair-bound man was brought to the Baba Sali and began slowly but surely walking again after vowing to become closer to Judaism. A woman whose daughter was injured in the eye during army service came to him for a blessing. The daughter recovered. A missing man was found on the exact day on which the Baba Sali said he would. An interview with longtime assistant David Gogan explains that the Baba Sali wanted no credit for his miracles. Like Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, he gave all the credit to God. He was scrupulous about never talking bad of anyone or of Israel. He usually kept his eyes lowered or covered his eyes with his hand. Golan stated that he considered himself nothing special and insisted that it was the power of the individual's own faith that made the miracles, not him. Politicians sought his endorsement, and wealthy businessmen offered to build him a better home and larger synagogue, but he rejected it all. Golan stated that once a distraught father credited the Baba Sali with helping his missing daughter return home. As a token of thanks, he gave him a watch and gold cufflinks. But Golan said that the Baba Sali gave them away, and he received the cufflinks, while the Baba Sali accepted nothing. The Baba Sali also composed Jewish liturgical poems, which are still sung today. One is in memory of his brother, who was executed in Morocco. Another is called Yodu Lecha Rayonai. A quick search on YouTube brings up countless different versions by contemporary singers. The following is a translation from Hebrew. I will rejoice in you, Hashem. I will rejoice in you, eternal God. I will rejoice in you, Savior of my soul, with final redemption. My thoughts will praise you, Hashem who from the womb formed me. You have brought me to Mount Sinai to enlighten my soul. That is why in my prayers, with my song, I will glorify you all the days and years until eternity. My heart is happy when I remember your kindness, for God chose of all people Israel as his servants, the seeds of a pure plant, the patriarchs, his beloved, unblemished, from the root he raised them. I want to fulfill your will, God, source of all will, as you originally led your flock in a beautiful pasture, where joy reigned, shepherd of Israel forever. Listen to their voices. The Baba Sali is remembered by both the Moroccan Jewish community as well as Hasidic groups and the general Israeli public. The 40th anniversary of his passing was marked in Israel, the United States, and Jewish communities around the world. The story of Moroccan Jewish Aliyah to Israel will be explored in a future episode. This has been a moment in Jewish history. Thank you to Yishai Fleischer. Thank you to all the listeners. 
and Shagun. And we are back. Thank you, Ben Bresky. And God bless. We have a picture of the Baba Sali the, here. That's right. And, our, and, and Baba Sali is in Otef Aza. That's right. That's right. Baba Sali's in Otef Aza. He is like the tzaddik of Otef Aza. That's right. Uh, and Nitty may vote. the, the merit, vote. yes, the, maybe the merit of Baba Sali protect Amen. Uh, everybody who's As in we say Aza in Hebrew, in Otef Aza. Amen. 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 Uh, now I want to play, a f- uh, to end the show, an important segment, which is uh, first I'm going to play a um, um, the panel featuring a lot of my good friends, featuring a lot of my good friends uh, on one panel. You'll hear me introduce it from the Sovereignty Conference run by the Sovereignty Movement uh, made by Nadia Matar and uh, Yehudi Katzover. So let's hear from the good folks uh, thinking very much about the future of Israel and the future of Gaza from the Sovereignty Conference. Thank you everybody for coming to the Sovereignty Conference in English, uh, reaching out to the world before I go on, I want to thank Nadia Matar and Yehudi Katzover of the Sovereignty Movement. You know, you know, Yehudi and Nadia are land activists. Uh, they are political activists, <clears throat> but they are also teachers. And one of the things that they've brought out is a simple word, sovereignty. They brought it out into the world. Beforehand, we didn't know exactly how to say the whole thing that we mean in one word. They were like, sovereignty. That's the word. Push it out. They call the movement that, and everybody, it's on everybody's lips. Sovereignty. So thank you very much for teaching us uh, that simple word that encompasses all that we mean. Uh, and thank you for this conference. Uh, folks, uh, 1,200 people murdered. 150 still abducted. Uh, many soldiers killed and wounded. Um, Israel's strategic situation is not simple with dangers from Gaza, Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, Iran, American campus, and even at The Hague. We face a lot of challenges. Uh, Israel's democracy was till very recently on very shaky ground with a lot of uh, divided polity. But this war has brought us together. I want to show you something that, Yehudi, uh, that Nadja mentioned for a second, and that is that the Ribbonut movement uh, uh, commissioned recently, just yesterday came out, a poll of Israeli public opinion, asking them simple things. Do you want a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria? 74%? No. Israelis? No. Do you want to see um, uh, uh, Israel to help voluntary emigration, voluntary resettlement of Gazans? 76%? Yes. These are numbers of public opinion. Things are changing. Israel's, we had a division not so long ago, now we're having some unity through this war. Indeed, right now, clarity is needed and a vision of victory is required. All, this, all the problems that we've faced really come from the failed idea of the two-state solution uh, all the way back to the uh, UN partition plan, the madness of land giveaway. When I speak to Arabs in Hebron, they tell me all the time one thing. They say, look, Yishai, you guys have left Gaza, you left Sinai, you left South Lebanon, you left Judea and Samaria, you're shrinking. You're shrinking, and with time, we will see you gone totally. Like we saw the Crusaders gone, you will be gone as well. That is what the Arabs say. That is what they think. And that is all the fruit of the two-state solution idea. We feed right into that when we tell them, yeah, we're leaving. They're like, you're going to leave partially, then you're going to leave all the way. Now is the time to challenge those old conceptions. That's what today is all about. And before I uh, start out the panel, I just want to finish with uh, one important message. And that is, today's conference is not a mere intellectual pursuit. We owe it to the fallen to make their death not be meaningless. We owe them. We owe all those people that at least we could say, yes, you were murdered, yes, you were killed, but because of that, we woke up and we changed course. So therefore, we're going to take these discussions with utmost seriousness and pray that God Hashem inspires us with His vision for Israel. All right. Um, I'm going to introduce the first panel. Uh, moderating is my good friend Alex Trayman, CEO and Jerusalem Bureau Chief of JNS, a Jewish news syndicate, very important uh, news, uh, news outlet. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, his journalist, radio show host, and documentary film editor. Uh, joining him will be Knesset member Danny Luz from the Likud Party, a former member of the Jerusalem City Council, born in Canada to Moroccan Jewish parents, and he's here with us today. Of course, Nadia Matar. Nadia, no, Nadia's not coming up. 
All right, Nadja already spoke. Josh Reinstein, a president of the Israel Allies Foundation, engages in pro-Israel Christian outreach around the world and is director of the Christian uh, Knesset Christian Allies Caucus, a very powerful caucus in the Knesset. Uh, Professor Eugene Kantorovich, uh, you all know him from Wall Street Journal for all the things that he does. Uh, director of the Scalia Law School Center for the Middle East and International Law and the head of the International Law Department at Kohelet Policy Forum. And Mark Zell, finally. Mark, uh, chairman of the executive committee of Ariel University and founder and vice president of Republicans Abroad in Israel. Thank you very much. Alex, take it away. Thank you, Yishai. And uh, welcome to everybody who's here. We're going to jump right in because they told us we don't have a lot of time. Okay. So... Uh, many of the concepts and conceptions uh, that led to a lot of the political and military decision-making were suddenly proved uh, to be worthless uh, on the attacks of October 7th. And yet the war brings itself a new set of challenges and opportunities. Um, you know, whether Israel succeeds at this time or not really depends on the ability to learn the lessons of October 7th and make quick shifts uh, and good decisions. So I want to start first, Dan, with you. You know, uh, one of the clearest misconceptions was that of deterrence, you know, that our enemies uh, wouldn't attack us. And we see that the enemies have not been deterred at all. How does this wake-up call alter the decision-making of Israel and its war cabinet, and how do we decide to press forward with its military campaign on the basis of this new uh, conception? Thank you very much. First of all, I want to say thank you to the organizers. I cannot help but say thank you to the organizer, and I cannot help also to say that I'm honored to be on this panel because I have a lot of role models here uh, with me on this panel. Nadia, you would have been also one of them if you were as uh, advertised. So thank you very much for inviting me uh, here today. Um, your question is a very good question. I think that one of the things that we realized on October 7th I, and I have to say the truth that some of us have been screaming this for years. Uh, and we have been screaming this for years. And I think that if, I, if we speak about the lessons that we can learn on October 7th, one of the titles that I can give is that the right was right. Uh, and I think that that's something that, uh, that needs to be said. Now, about your specific question, uh, over the years there has been this uh, flawed strategy uh, that as long as our enemies are just building power but not using it, then it's okay. Now, this is ridiculous. And uh, a lot of us have also warned against that over the years. Uh, but it started slowly, slowly, and then we got into some type of problem because as they built power it ended up being coupled with another argument that said, wait, now they're powerful. Taking this power away from them, all these, they have a ton of weapons, they have a ton of things. Taking this power away from them will cost a heavy price. And as we see, unfortunately, in Gaza today, it costs a heavy price. I think that the one thing that we learned today and the polls that we heard presented a few minutes ago, I think, show that this is something which has entered the consensus of Israeli society. It's not even about right and left anymore. It's the fact that two things. First of all, we're willing to pay the price, and Israeli society as a society is willing to pay a price. I have to tell you that I'm a lot uh, in funerals, in shivot, on the one hand. On the other hand, Le'avdil, I'm also uh, next to soldiers. Uh, in the front, and the one message that I get from everyone all the time, also even from people that are kicked out of their homes right now and that are in hotels, the one message that I get from everyone is don't stop. It's not comfortable to be in a hotel. Trust me, it sounds comfortable. It's not. To be a whole family in one hotel room, it's not. It's also not easy to be a soldier, and it's definitely not easy to have lost a close, close one, but everyone tells us, don't stop. And so I think that there is an understanding that we're willing to pay the price. I see that we're short on time, so I'll stop here for now. Thanks. Uh...
We see very clearly when we get attacked by a terror organization like Hamas, sure, they have tens of thousands of rockets, they have tunnel infrastructure, but they're fighting against the IDF, which is one of the strongest and most agile militaries in the world. And you understand that Hamas doesn't actually think that they can really beat the IDF on the battlefield, uh, even on their own home turf. And, and when you zoom out, you see that actually what Hamas's strategy is, is to invite Israel in, kill as many civilians as possible there, and then use the battle of international legitimacy against the state of Israel. And, and we see that very clearly this week now with what's going on at the uh, Court of, of uh, International uh, Justice, the ICJ. Uh, Eugene, you know, we see that, uh, you know, we, we had these accusations against us for years of occupation, then apartheid, and now genocide. You know, what can we learn about the way that international law is being used against the state of Israel, and, and, and how do we counter that? Okay. So, on. So, uh, many ways in respect to international law, there is a thing called international law, but when it comes to Israel, that thing goes away. Uh, we have a strong desire to conform to international law, to be as part of the rules of this club that we want to belong to, the community of nations. And if it were achievable, it would be a potentially worthy goal. There could be diplomatic benefits. But we're very much like Charlie Brown in this situation. Charlie Brown liked a girl, Lucy. Lucy didn't really like him and didn't have time for him, wasn't interested. But she would at least sometimes tell him that they could at least play football together. And she would hold the football and he would come running to kick, and she would pull it away. Now, there's a, there's a painting that's a kind of a meta version of this, in which she's holding the football and there's nothing there, it's just air that she, she's going to pull out. Um, we, are, we are Charlie Brown, and uh, the international community, the organs of the international community are, are Lucy, and the football is international law. Uh, when people lived in Gush Katif, we were told that the, we're, we, were, we were called occupiers. And this has a diplomatic price. Right? The international community is upset with us. There's friction because they call us occupiers. So let's end the friction. And as soon as they, we ended the friction, they still call us occupiers, and now we're guilty of apartheid. Okay, but we're going to be, we're gonna be nice about it, and when they shoot rockets at us, we're not going to do much. And we're not going to sort of push back in we're not going to do what was said would happen if any single rocket was fired. What was said during the disengagement would happen. And we can at least keep it at occupation and apartheid. Now they come to kill all the Jews, and they've elevated it to genocide. In other words, the thing we did to get out from under the occupation label didn't get us out from the occupation label, and it's been ratcheted up two degrees to the high. They're going to have to invent a new crime now, super genocide. For, for, for the next level of rhetorical inflation. But even, I think that, you know, pursuing diplomatic ends and having good relations with the, country of the world, countries of the world is a, is a worthwhile goal. But we have to understand that the methods we are seeking to achieve it are not achieving it. Right? We're kicking the non-existent football that's going to be pulled out uh, in, in front of us, um, and we are only undermining our international credibility with these actions. Uh, Mark, I'm going to come back to you. <laughs> Mark, uh, we, this week, uh, Anthony Blinken just made his fourth visit uh, to Israel. And, you know, from the first moment of the war, he came out here. We also saw visits from uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, from uh, Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, and even from President Biden himself. Uh, and there were overwhelming statements and continue to be overwhelming statements of support for Israel in its mission to dismantle Hamas. Uh, and yet, at the same time, Blinken continues to meet with Mahmoud Abbas, uh, the head of the Palestinian Authority, and is pressuring Israel to provide humanitarian aid in Gaza, to reduce civilian casualties in Gaza, to lessen the intensity of the war, to prevent a wider conflict, and also to get Israel back on the track toward a two-state solution, and at the same time also trying to uh, get funding to Iran, which is 
uh, building illicit nuclear weapons and funding all the terror organizations uh, that have created a circle of fire around the state of Israel. You know, what do we learn on October 7th and throughout this war about the actual state of the relationship between Israel and the United States? Well, thank you very much, and thank you to Nadja and Yodit for your extraordinary work here today at this conference. I heard the Hebrew uh, portion was a great success, and I hope the English one will continue in that vein. Listen, um, I'm wearing a pin here. It has the flags of the United States and Israel on it. And I'm an American citizen as well as an Israeli citizen, and I'm proud to be both. But I'm not proud, I'm not proud, Alex, uh, about how the United States government under this administration has been acting since October 7th and before. Indeed, during the entire time of the Biden administration since they took office on January 20th, 2021, it's been a disgrace. And I'll tell you what, what, what uh, particularly bothers me is the extent to which many here in Israel have swallowed the American uh, line, the, the, the line of the Biden administration about having Israel's back. You heard that from the President of the United States almost uh, immediately after October 7th. He said, we have Israel's back. And then they would say, we will do everything we can to help Israel defend itself. Now, what it didn't say at that time, what the president didn't say is, we want Israel to go in and finish Hamas. That's what the president, the prime minister of Israel was saying. That was the government of Israel was saying. The president of the United States and his secretary of state and the secretary of defense and the leaders of the Democratic Party were all saying, defend yourself. Okay, we'll help you defend yourself. And indeed, they sent us munitions that we desperately need, desperately need because we gave up in response to another administration, the Obama administration, the ability to produce those munitions here in Israel. So we, we have, yeah, yeah. So a time, one of the lessons we have to take, uh, Alex, from, from the, the Gaza war is we've got to start producing those basic uh, commodities, those weapons, now. Now, okay, we not listen and not become dependent on the United States or anybody else for, to, to, to defend ourselves. But the other thing is, yesterday at the, uh, you mentioned the Secretary's press conference. You know, he started off and he, he gave this very nice statement about, well, the, what, what, what is happening, what Israel is doing in, in Gaza is not genocide. Okay, great, great, not genocide. But immediately after that, he says, you've got to put the Palestinian Authority back in charge of Gaza the day after the war stops. Now, what is... <laughs> that's, that's absolute insanity, okay? We've seen, we've seen exactly what Palestinian rule does. Gaza was, in all, for all intents and purposes, Eugene, an independent state. Right? It had a military, it had a foreign relations, it was received, had international uh, economic ties. It was a state. I'll tell you something else. Back in the 90s, I represented the U.S. government in the Clinton administration uh, helping to build projects in Gaza. So I was in Gaza literally every, every day for, for months. And we actually thought at that time, that if Gaza, which had a free and opportunity to rebuild its, its economy, could do so, it would become the Singapore of the Middle East. We really thought that. But it was, became very clear from the very beginning. You, know, you go to the offices of the ministers, you talk to the people from the custodian in the school to the minister of education and the prime minister there. They all were, had one, one goal in mind, and that was the destruction of the state of Israel. So they blew it. So anyway, yesterday Lincoln came up and he said, build a Palestinian state, increase humanitarian aid to Gaza. This is an embarrassment. This is a slap in the face of the Israeli people. And I think we, need, we in Israel need to understand this, that, that, that the United States is a friend, but this administration has another agenda, and it's not for us. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks.
Josh, we saw with the attacks on October 7th that uh, the battle for public opinion is a major component of this war, and we see battle lines being drawn immediately, those that come out in support of the state of Israel and those that come out uh, in support of Palestinian causes, in some cases even in support of Hamas and what they did on October 7th. We have uh, various protests around the world in, in London, in, in Paris, in Washington, in Los Angeles, in New York, all anti-Israel protests. And, you know, as someone who works with parliaments around the world, you know, what do we learn about how these battle lines have been drawn? And how do we use that knowledge in order to try to build and improve uh, relationships and improve public opinion? Well, thank you very much, Alex. And first of all, I'd like to thank Yudi Katsover and Nadi Matar, uh, really an example of what two women of courage and conviction with God on their side can do uh, over the last amazing, amazing role models. I've known Nadia for 28 years, and it makes me feel very old, so. Um, look, the, the ferocity of the attack, the genocide, the murder, the rape, has really caused a situation where there is a line, okay? Everyone knows now who are the good guys and who are the bad guys just from where even their rhetoric comes to. So, for example, the U.N. Secretary General is a bad guy. He's okay with the murder of babies and the rape of women. The evil man. Yeah, everyone knows it. Anyone who wants to be honest about it, the president of Brazil, bad guy. He's okay with slaughter of people and the killing of families and burning them alive. President of Argentina, good guy. He's against it. Yeah. Uh, and so you can tell who's good and who's bad for the first time in a very long time. Because for a long time, we saw that people were giving a lot of lip service, but they weren't really standing with Israel. But the truth is, is that the most important thing now, when it comes to international support, is Christian support for Israel. Right. You told me, I just want to focus here for a second, because you told me that uh, those that support Israel have one thing in common, and those that so don't support Israel have another thing in common. What is that? Yeah, well, you can look at it. What, what I call faith-based diplomacy, it's when people take their biblical support and turn it real, into real political action, today is the most important weapon we have in our diplomatic arsenal. It's the reason we have embassies in Jerusalem. It's the reason we have anti-BDS legislation that stopped financial BDS. It's even the reason we have observer status in the African Union. It's because Christians have gotten involved in this campaign to stand with Israel because they believe it's the right thing to do. And just take, uh, and we talked about this briefly, take the two past administrations. You have the Trump administration and you have the Biden administration. Well, what's the big difference between the Biden and the Trump administration? It's the people in the administration. Mike Pence is a Bible-believing Christian who loves Israel. In fact, if he talks about Jerusalem, he starts tearing up. Mike Pompeo, Bible-believing Christian loves Israel. Ron DeSantis, Bible-believing Christian loves Israel. Nikki Haley, Bible the, the base of the Republican Party are these Christians who stand with Israel. And when you look at the other administration, who's in the administration? Atheists, people who are godless, people who don't really care about you know, these type of things, or are anti, or people who are anti-Jewish or anti-Christian. So what we're doing is we're duplicating that in countries around the world. We have 53 Israel allies caucuses in countries around the world, and we're mobilizing them to build incredible political support for Israel. And I'll just give you an example from today. I don't know if you saw the, this farce of a trial. I don't even know why we're there, but there's this farce of the trial in, in, in The Hague. 5,000 Christians with Israeli flags marched in front of there. And so... What was mentioned before is it would be great if we were strong and our leaders were strong and we just make the decisions for ourselves. But for too many years, our leaders have been hiding behind international support. They say, look, I would love to annex Judea and Samaria. Didn't, didn't Bibi say that during the Trump administration? If only I could, but I'm sorry, they won't let us do it. There's too much pressure. We can't do it. Well, let's use that pressure against them. We can build millions of people to understand the issues, to understand people who understand what is Hebron. What is Shiloh? What is Beit El? To say, we need to save these places and we need to defend it. And that's what we're doing. And I think it's important that everyone reaches out to the international community and understand that this conflict is a religious conflict. It's not a political conflict. It has nothing to do with land. It has nothing to do for land peace. It is the Quran right or is the Tanakh right? And that's why we see atheists and extreme liberals on the actual side of radical Islam. They have nothing in common other than their hatred of the Tanakh and the Jewish people.
That's the only thing that unites them. But we also see on the other side Jews and Christians who do believe in the Bible who are standing together. And I think it's a very important development in the 21st century. Dan, Dan, as a member of Knesset, you're on numerous committees, and you're also the chairman of the Knesset's Abraham Accords Caucus. Uh, You wrote this week in The Hill, I'm just going to quote from you here, statehood ostensibly under the Palestinian Authority would inadvertently credit Hamas with a monumental victory, setting a dangerous precedent that massacres can yield political gains. You add that concessions in response to terror beget more terror. But then you go on to say that you envision a significant role for international actors, particularly moderate Arab countries from the Abraham Accords in Gaza's rehabilitation. So first of all, you know, why are we interested in having other regional players have any role in what's going on in Gaza? But how do, does the Abraham Accords uh, provide a model that can be useful uh, in the day after the, Israel's war with Hamas? So let me try by starting to explain the first part of uh, what I said, and then I'll get to your question. I'm not ducking it, don't worry. Uh, the first part uh, is that we have to be very clear with the world that even though I think that most people in this room, and me included, have for years explained why a Palestinian state is bad, it's the wrong solution, it's not a solution, uh, it's, a, uh, it's just making the problem worse for religious reasons, for security reasons, for all the reasons that we know. I don't want to get into it too much. Right now, at this time, establishing a Palestinian state would be exponentially worse if the result of October 7th is that a Palestinian state is established. What this says is that massacres bring diplomatic gain. This is... This is something that's dangerous, not just for Israel. And this is why I wrote this in the Hill, so that the Americans understand that. And hopefully I'll write that in French. You can hear my accent. So that the French also know that. And so that the whole world understands that. If we get into this this cycle where violence brings diplomatic gain, then this is something which is dangerous for the whole free world. And right now, we're in the front lines But what we're fighting for, what I see soldiers in Miluim here, but what our soldiers are fighting for is, first of all, for the Jewish state, of course. That's the most important thing to our hearts. But they're also fighting for the whole free world. And the free world needs to understand and appreciate that what they're fighting for is also for them. And so that's why I wrote this. About, about the Abraham Accords, what I meant is that I think that there is a model in Abraham Accords countries when it comes to, uh, let's call, uh, people like calling it denazification. Uh, the, the Abraham Accords countries that are an absolutely horrible educational system before the Abraham Accords. When you look at it now, their educational system is actually quite positive. And I want to see this type of process happen with whatever... Uh, population stays in Gaza afterwards. I have to say that I do uh, agree with my friend Gila Gamliel that we have to uh, press the world to open their doors uh, to refugees. After all, they do that for... We're not even talking, even before we start talking about incentivizing immigration, or even before we start talking about... I'm talking about people who already want to go, but no one wants to get them. Not only that, There's threats against Israel. Don't you try to allow them to leave or to try to find ways for them to leave. This is hypocrisy. Everywhere else in the world, when there's refugees, the world begs countries to integrate them. Here, they beg countries not to integrate them. Why? So that they stay here and and keep being a problem for the Jews. That's basically, that's the only reason why they don't want them to immigrate. But whatever population stays, I don't know if we, even if it's, I don't know. I don't want to give numbers, you know, but whatever, we want it to be not radicalized. And I think that Abraham, of course, countries do bring us a model of something that's possible. Do you, I, I'm an optimistic person, but when it comes to international relations, I have to say I'm a realist. So I, we'll, we'll still need the IDF there. We'll still need to make sure that violence doesn't happen. It's not a short process, but that's, that's basically what I meant. You mentioned uh, some of the other refugee crises uh, in recent years. And, of course, just to our north, we had the Syrian civil war. And you had 
close to 13 million displaced uh, citizens in the war, and 6 million of them were settled uh, outside of Syria, many of them in Turkey, many of them in Europe and elsewhere. And of course, the, the moment that Russia invaded Ukraine, you had refugees running for the border. You've had 8 million displaced Ukrainians, and 6 million of them have been uh, displaced outside of Ukraine. In fact, uh, Israel's taken tens of thousands of Ukrainians into Israel. And yet, we're being told that Palestinians don't have the basic human right to flee the war zone, which is uh, something interesting. You have to ask the question, well, do the people around the world that really care about the Palestinians actually care about the Palestinians if they're not allowing them the basic right to flee if they want to? Now, in the very beginning of the war, Israel displaced many Palestinians because they dropped leaflets and they told everybody to move to the south. And you had everybody from the north uh, now sitting in the south of the border, just a couple of miles from, from the Rafah crossing. Uh, the situation for Gazans is not pretty right now. And uh, Eugene, this re week you wrote a memo together with uh, Raphael Biton and uh, Professor Avi Bell, you know, countering claims within the security establishment that under in international law that Israel had to allow residents that were displaced from the north to return. You wrote in the memo that Israel has no legal obligation to allow displaced Gaza residents to return to their homes in the northern Gaza Strip for the coming months. Uh, you know, there is a real refugee problem. How does Israel address it, and, and how do you navigate the complexities of, Israel, of international law in order to uh, get there? This memo is in response to some ideas percolating in some corners of the legal establishment, um, which are strange ideas. Uh, there's still a war on, and the notion, which currently uh, Secretary Blinken is actually pressuring the Israeli government to, to implement, that people should return to the north while the war is still on, while soldiers are still dying. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I actually got a call. I got the call. Hey, what do you think about the legal uh, question of um, having, the, having people come back to the north because things are winding down? As I was uh, sitting in the shiver house of, of a neighbor, uh, young man Ephraim Jackman died in the north, and they're already talking about bringing people back. Now, in the north, there's not much to come back to currently, and it's a war zone. So there's an obvious adverse selection problem. Of course, there's people very excited to come back there because they're Hamasniks. Normal families are not excited to come back there. Uh, that's quite clear. And uh, there is still, in fact, a war on. Um, Gaza, it's true. Uh, I'll elaborate on the er earlier comments. Gaza has now finally become the world's largest open-air prison. And the international community is happy to have Gaza be like a North Korea from which there is no escape and no exit simply to allow Hamas to use its population as human shields and increase the pressure on Israel. Um, the, the, an the answer to this is very clear. Egypt has obligations under the Refugee Convention. Uh, Egypt has obligations under other international treaties. Um, Egypt is a neutral country which must not turn away asylum seekers at its, uh, at its borders. Um, and I think this is another example of what I sort of said at the start. When you have countries that accept millions of uh, uh, asylum seekers, refugee, refugees from conflict zones around the world, but not got, the United States. The United States has a wide open border and all sorts of people are coming across every moment. But God forbid they pressure Egypt to let a single Gazan through. It just shows international law works differently when it comes to us. Uh, we're going to have to keep the answers brief because we're, we're running out of time, and I want to get at least two more questions in. Mark, it's, it's often being reported that the Biden administration is making uh, some of its calculations uh, on the basis of this being an election year and fears of losing support uh, from the Democratic Party's progressive base. You know, how do the upcoming U.S. elections factor into the equation as Israel continues its war effort? Well, just following up on what I said earlier, I mean, the Biden administration is the cause of a lot of these problems. I mean, had, had there not been a change in administration in 2021, I think it's very doubtful that the, that the conflict in the Ukraine would have occurred, where the conflict here in Israel, in the Middle East, would have occurred on October 7th. So changing the administration back to what it was in 2020 is a primary goal of uh, the Republican Party and uh, that I represent. And I hope... Uh, 
those of you who are in Israel that have the right to vote in the United States do so, regardless of where you may, uh, may live or may be registered. It's extremely important that we vote. I just, before I uh, finish up, I just want to say one thing about UNRWA. Okay. The, the, the minister said that UNRWA has, been, has neglected its duty. No. UNRWA has been a primary uh, advocate of the Hamas regime. It has, it has been an aider and a better of terrorism. And I, and I don't know, Gene, you and I should talk about this, but I, I believe that a complaint could be brought against UNRWA and the International Criminal Court in The Hague, not the International Court, okay, to do something about that, 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 that uh, 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 complete anomaly. I mean, the, the fact that this international organization taking in hundreds of, oh, what did you say, a billion dollars or more uh, annually and, and is spending that money on terror to attack a neighboring state, unacceptable. That goes to the International Criminal Court or whatever form we can get to put an end to it. Thanks. Josh, uh, you're working with uh, Knesset members uh, to strengthen relations with parliamentarians in other countries around the world. Tell me briefly, you know, what do MKs here not understand about how other parliaments work? You know, how do MKs need to change their approach post October 7th? And also, what specific steps can other parliaments around the world take to improve Israel's strategic position? I'm not talking about uh, you, even though you're a member of the Knesset Christian Allies Caucus. Um, yeah, so first of all, what people need to understand is that we'll never win in an international organization because the majority of countries in the world are dictators and tyrants. They're run by dictators and tyrants. They're, they're not democracies. So we'll always lose at the UN. We'll always use in the international court, and we'll always lose the IMF. So the strategy that we do is that we started caucuses within parliaments. So within parliaments, we have an advantage. We have 53 Israel allies caucuses. These are groups of members of parliament who say, I like Israel, I want to do something for Israel, and I need to get something done for Israel because it's an issue of faith for me. So there are no Palestinian allies caucuses in any of these parliaments. There's no Arab allies caucuses. There's only Israel allies caucuses. So where we need to focus our attention is in the individual countries themselves. And we need to go after the good countries, not the ones, you know, we can't worry about what Russia is going to say about this because Russia is not on our side. We can't worry what North Korea says or, you know, Qatar. And we should also call out the bad actors. And so one of the things that we've done is we've done it through what we call faith-based diplomacy because the real superpower of Israel is our faith. It's, it's Hashem. We don't win the wars because Jews are good athletes. We win the wars because Hashem is with us, and when we fight, he comes into battle with us. So we need to understand on the international community the same thing applies. We'll never win the political argument. There's one Jewish vote in the United Nations compared to 22 Muslim votes or Arab votes, many more Muslim votes. Uh, economically, we're not going to win. We don't have the oil money of our neighbors. We have to appeal to something that people care about. And that's their faith. And so there are millions of Christians who have their elected officials in parliaments who are people of faith. And just like I wouldn't eat a pork sandwich for $10 million because I'm Jewish and I believe that that's wrong, they wouldn't go against Israel because they believe that's wrong. And so our attention needs to be focused on those individuals that we know who they are and then develop that relationship. And it has to be done at the Knesset level. It has to be colleague to colleague. And the truth is the foreign ministry should be more involved in this. And I'm happy to say that for the first time, we had a foreign minister, Ellie Cohen, who worked in faith-based diplomacy. And what did we see? Seven countries in nine months said they're moving their embassies to Jerusalem. <laughs> Boom. If we just change the perception from, okay, what's the political advantage? What's the economic advantage? To who are our friends and how can we mobilize that? We'll win. And guess what? It's happening in Europe. Italy, Sweden, Holland, all went to the right, all led by Christians. It's going to happen in the EU elections coming up. And so we just need to go with that wave and show what we believe is what they believe, and we need to work together. Well, you know, in a way, we're, we're just warming up and just getting started, and we could sit here for another hour, but there are two great panels uh, right after us. So thank you, guys. Uh,
Round of applause for our participants in the panel. Thank you very much. All right, Mark, and one more last audio for the show, and that is uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the fathers, uh, one of the captives. Uh, his father is a rabbi in uh, Hebron, in Kiryat Arba Hebron, and he also spoke uh, at the Sovereignty Conference very, very much more uh, uh, movingly than I expected. Uh, so here's uh, uh, the last audio I'll play you from this week, for this week, from the Sovereignty Conference, a father of one of the captives that we pray for uh, and hope to come back soon. There is a sore that we all feel, and that is uh, the deaths, uh, the toll, uh, and also uh, the hostages. And we have with us today Rabbi Tzvika Moore. He's a rabbi from Kiryat Arba, whose son Eitan is being held by Hamas in Gaza. Rabbi Moore is a member of the Tikva Forum. Rabbi Moore, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. This is my son, Eitan. I wrote something, things, and I want to, to read, okay? If that's okay? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So, my name is Vika Mor, and I am the father of Eitan, who is currently kidnapped in Gaza. When my wife, Efrat, and I got married, we asked ourselves where it was important for the people of Israel that we build our house. After examining several options, we decided to join the protection of the cave of the patriarchs, Marat HaMachpelah, and to make our home in Kiryat Arba Hebron. We educate our children that the state of Israel should always be the most important thing in our lives. The state of Israel for us is a fulfillment of the vision of the prophets who promised us that we would return here and build our state for the third time forever. The state of Israel is the home and historical stage of the people of Israel and we as its citizens, must do everything for its existence and prosperity. The contribution to the country and giving in general, in general are top values for our son Eitan as well. After the attack began on Simchat Torah, Eitan, who was a security guard in the south, saved many people. At 2.30 in the afternoon, after he and uh, other security guards gathered about 20 citizens and fled south with them, Eitan and his friend Eliakim Liebman found two bodies lying on the ground. These were two girls who were murdered during their escape from the Nova party. Both decided to hide the bodies so that terrorists would not find them and kidnap them to Gaza. After hiding one body in a pit, they returned to take the other, and there they were kidnapped by terrorists. The concern for those girls who were murdered caused them the price of the kidnapping. In this act, Eitan fulfilled the education and values he received at home, and we are very proud of him from the bravery and nobility of spirit he demonstrated in his behavior. <laughs> if you look at the WhatsApp group of the hostages families, you will see that it's reflecting the cultural struggle in Israel. In this group, the big issues and questions of this generation arise. The issues are not always visible, but beneath the surface, it is clear that the real discussion is about what is human, does he have a destiny, and if so, what is his destiny? Is the main thing in life is just to live, or to, to live, or the main thing is to live a life of meaning? Is the land of Israel is just a real estate or the land promised us by God? What is the relationship between the individual and the, and the state? Another question, another question that is constantly on the agenda is about the immediate profit in the present 
while risking, while, while risking the future of all of us in Israel and more. We, as a family, found ourselves in even, uh, and even at uh, the, the end of this struggle and decided to be strong for, for the future of, of the state of Israel and for the people of Israel. We understood that despite our great pain, we must take care of all the people in Israel and demand that Israeli government will cope the hostages affair according to national honor and national res uh, responsibility. The state of Israel and the people of Israel have paid enough as a result of the Arabic terrorism, not only on October 7, but for the last hundred years. In the events of 1921, 1929, and 1936, 630 Jews were slaughtered by Arabs. In January 1948, 35 fighters of the Palmach were massacred on their way to provide aid to the Gush Etzion settlements. These terrible stories took place before the state was established and before there were occupied terror, uh, territories. Even since the establishment of the State of Israel, thousands of Jews have paid with their lives because of Arab terrorism. If we want to live in this land, we must first be sovereign in our thinking. Even in, a, uh, even in relation to the current war and handling the issue of the hostages, we must act as sovereigns. In the Bible, we found four cases of, of hostages. In the book of Genesis, Bereshit, two cases are cited. In the first case, Lot was taken hostage by the kings of the north, and Abraham chased them, uh, fought, and brought Lot back. The second story about Dinah in the city of Nablus, Shechem, Shimon and Levi kill the, the, the townspeople and rescue Dinah. The third case is presented in the book Bamidbar, chapter number 21. The Knaani, king of Arad, kidnaps a woman from Am Israel who rescued, rescued her by war. The fourth case in the, book of, uh, is in the book of Samuel, which is so familiar to this war, David and his army rescued 600 hostages, women and children, taken by Amalek. In all these cases, we didn't see negotiations. We didn't see Israeli uh, representatives begging for help from other nations around the world. But we do see responsibility. We saw uh, uh, initiative and we saw sovereignty. I truly think that Israel government should act through these attitudes and values. We pray that God will give strength to our leaders to release the hostages by national strength without any payment or surrender and we will have a crushing victory over all our enemies. Amen. All right, folks. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us through thick and thin. Am Yisrael is challenged, and yet we fight and we push it forward, and Bezrat Hashem, we're going to be strong together. Hashem is making this time for us to challenge us to, and, and, and to, and to um, put us through a crucible, make a stronger metal inside. We come out stronger. We come out, we come out pure. We come out... You know, the, the every one of these that are fallen are an offering and a sacrifice to God and somehow atone for the rest of us and for Am Yisrael. Their souls will come back and we've got to pray for strength right now and for guidance and for, for pushing through this time. Am Yisrael is going to live 
Lenetzach for eternity and and Am Yisrael in Eretz Yisrael in the land of Israel, the state of Israel. It's happening now. Yes, with great challenges. And things want to bring us down, but we won't let them because we won't let the terrorists win in two ways. They won't take our, our children and also depress us. No, we're going to have those children. We're going to raise them in the Jewish way. We're going to be upbeat and strong. Hashem, I'm asking for you, from you personally, give me strength. Uh, give us strength. Give this family strength and all of our listeners and friends strength. Maka Fleischer, I want to thank you so much for being with me. You're awesome. You are awesome. You're an awesome, awesomeness. And You're awesome too. You give me awesomeness feelings. Uh, about about strength in life and you're the pillar of our household and we want to bless you so much and Thanks, we want to bless all the Jewish ladies and all the pro-Israel ladies and all the pro-Israel folks out there be strong and of good heart of good consciousness I'm Israel Chai the nation of Israel lives Hashem is with us and he's given us strength let us not fall for any depression because that would be a victory for the enemy God wants us to be in joy and in fight and it's all going to work out amen God bless you stay strong stay tuned stay connected Shalom Shalom <laughs>